Hi everyone, uh, my name is Konstantin Tenhardt and um, I have to warn you, this is not going to be a funny talk. I'm German, we don't do that. <laughs> um, so, um, but I don't, actually don't live in um, Germany anymore. Um, last year I moved to Ottawa, Canada, and as so many Ruby developers in um, Ottawa, I actually work for Shopify. And in fact, we have so many Ruby developers um, that we just don't know where to put them, and we sent them all down to Kansas to speak at RailsConf. <laughs> And so, Kat already gave a talk, and there's two of us speaking later in the afternoon about um, how we test and um, about sprockets. Um, to continue with the shameless self-promotion, you can find me on uh, Twitter and GitHub. My handle is T60. And in my spare time, I'm maintaining a couple of libraries that you might find interesting. Um, one of them is Action Widgets, which is a UI component micro framework, I'd say, for Ruby on Rails. In fact, uh, the slides you just see here on screen are powered by Action Widgets. Um, I'm maintaining Smart Properties, which is supercharged um, Ruby attribute assessors, um, as well as a processing pipeline for Ruby on Rails to model complex business processes. And finally, the one I want to talk today about, Request Interceptor, which is uh, my most recent one. And it allows you to simulate foreign APIs with Sinatra. So, at its core, this talk is all about testing. And um, specifically, uh, one type of test, tests that involve HTTP connections. So, most of you might know the libraries uh, VCR and WebMock, uh, which are usually used to stub out individual requests, or in case of VCR, replay requests that have previously been sent to a remote API. Um, I want to present a different approach today and uh, talk about how we can use Sinatra to simulate a foreign API within our test suite. And that is essentially the core idea behind um, Request Interceptor. So, um, I guess I best show you how to use the library first, and then um, throughout the talk we dive deeper and deeper into how it actually works internally, um, to the point where I'll show what kind of meta-programming techniques I use to hook into uh, the Net HTTP library um, to make all that magic happen. So, yeah, I just mentioned it. Request Interceptor does modify Net HTTP, um, just like WebMock and VCR. There is no clean way to sort of um, interject yourself into what uh, Net HTTP does, so some trickery is required to make that work. But um, I get back to that later. The idea is that you can use any REC compatible app and use it as a request interceptor that sort of intercepts an HTTP request sent out by uh, your application and reroutes it to your rack app, which will then handle the request in line. And in fact, all you need to know, essentially, is that Request Interceptor implements a run method, which takes um, a rack application as well as a hostname pattern. So the hostname pattern is important to know when Request Interceptor sort of starts intercepting requests. It will actually look at the HTTP request and only redirect the request to your own rack app if it matches the hostname. Otherwise, the HTTP request will be made um, just as a regular remote request. And in the code example here, I define the probably most minimal rack app uh, you could potentially implement. It's simply a Lambda statement um, that returns an array with a status code, no headers, and a message, hello. And then I use request interceptor to intercept all requests that go to anything that ends with, any host that ends with example.com. Um, I do my uh, HTTP request and then assert on the equality of the response being hello. The problem with bare metal rack apps is that they are very inconvenient. To sort of implement um, something more feature complete, 
you wouldn't necessarily want to go with REC directly. Instead, you want to pick something that has a little more, um, that provides you with a little more convenience. And for me, this convenience is sort of um, given by Sinatra, which sort of combines simplicity as well as provides you with a, we uh, with a lot of flexibility on how to uh, simulate these API endpoints. And for those of you who don't know Sinatra, um, it is a Ruby micro web framework, and it's uh, based around a very simple idea. Um, you have a Sinatra application that provides you with um, more or less, well, the most important methods are get, post, put, and delete, which correspond to uh, the HTTP methods, and they allow you to define request handlers in your Sinatra application. So they take a path as the first um, argument and then a block and the block defines how requests are being handled. So a simple Sinatra app looks something like that. You don't even need to wrap it in a class or anything. Um, it provides you with some magic to make this work and you require the library. You define that your um, your application is handling anything that comes into slash hello, and in this case it returns hello Sinatra. So given this conciseness and this simplicity, um, Sinatra was an excellent choice to sort of model um, APIs, and um, therefore makes a great combination with uh, request interceptor. In fact, um, I went um, further because of this great combination, it's the combination I would suggest um, for you to use instead of using request interceptor dot run um, with just any rack app, I would recommend using Sinatra and request interceptor gives you a define method which allows you to define a new, um, a new Sinatra application um, with, a, uh, with some extra uh, goodness. So, um, a request interceptor allows you to define the host name pattern. Um, again, just as we've seen before, where we um, submit the host name pattern and the application to the run method, we now define it uh, right on the application, and then we just define it as a regular Sinatra app with all of our endpoints that we need. And the, and the result of um, this define call is a class again, which is a Sinatra application with um, the added benefits. And one of those benefits is that um, this application provides you with an intercept method. And the intercept method is just a convenient wrapper for you around run. So instead of having to pass in everywhere where you want to use an interceptor, remember which host name you want to match, and which application to pass in, you can just um, call intercept on your interceptor, provide it with a block, and then again, uh, fire off an HTTP request and assert that the correct message is returned. And then more importantly, in order to uh, test this, you probably want to know how many requests you made, um, which requests you actually made, and what the re uh, request and response data um, was and to make this possible, um, the intercept method returns a transaction lock. So it's simply an array of um, request interceptor transactions. And these transactions are um, simply structs which give you access to the request and the response um, that, was, that was made within um, the block. And these are instances of RackMock request and RackMock response, just as other libraries um, usually use for testing um, Rack applications. Um, I essentially use these to carry all the data for further inspection. And then the example down below shows you how you can, for instance, assert on the path of the first uh, transaction uh, log entry. And in this case, I'm just asserting that um, my program called um, the path hello um, of example.com. You can also nest them in case you um, you want to have you you communicate with multiple APIs. And um, at Shopify, I was um, on the team that implemented the Uber Rush integration. We did that as a separate app. So for us. Um, 
Shopify was, um, we also treated Shopify as an API, just as you would if you develop an app for Shopify. And then we treated Uber as our other service. So um, our application was actually, had to communicate with both of these services. And um, it's often necessary that you uh, know exactly um, which requests were sent where. Um, and that is why request interceptors do support um, nesting. So both of these interceptors write a separate transactional log. And yes, of course the innermost interceptor takes precedence. So if you, you can actually have two interceptors responding to the same domain um, or to the same host, um, in which case the innermost would win and intercept the request. Another important feature is um, that you can customize an interceptor for an individual test because the idea is that you generally outline your service that you are uh, modeling in a single file and then um, customize it to certain behavior that fits sort of the needs of your test. Um, let's say you want to model an error response um, for one particular endpoint. You would take your interceptor call the dot customize method on it, and then override the previously defined endpoint. And Sinatra is smart enough that if you redefine an endpoint, it, the, the new endpoint will take precedence over the old one. And in this case, uh, we are just switching the hello endpoint from, uh, to send another message. Previously it was high RailsConf, and now it's um, bonjour RailsConf. So now that you have a basic understanding on how they work, um, I want to talk a little uh, about the advantages um, in comparison to VCR and WebMark that I think exist when using um, request interceptors. Um, for me, one of the biggest advantages is that the code isn't cluttered throughout your uh, test suite. Instead, um, what we do is we have one, one file that defines a particular service, in our case, Uber or Shopify, that implements all the endpoints we are usually communicating with. And then we customize this interceptor to specific needs in our test suite. But if you sort of want to see in one go what your app is actually communicating with, you would just open the file and look at the interceptor definition. Another advantage for me is that uh, interceptors provide greater uh, power and flexibility because um, we're talking about um, a Sinatra application. You can literally go as far as you want with that. Um, you could have theoretically an in-memory database that sort of keeps state um, if you wanna, wanna in simulate entire workflows or you can keep it super simple and return static responses uh, from your endpoints. So it's really up to you. Then, of course, since it's essentially just one file, you can also go further and package it into a Ruby gem. Let's say um, you build a service that other, uh, that other developers use and you have a public API and now you want uh, to make it easier for people to sort of um, integrate your service. Um, you could provide them with a predefined interceptor they can use in their test suite so uh, they don't even think about um, hitting your API with like requests from their test suite. And then finally, and that is personally for me super important, uh, important is that the code is just very readable, which is in the nature of a Sinatra application. Um, and I personally think it's more readable than having these webmark um, stubs um, sort of scattered around your test suite. Instead you have this uh, one single application that defines how your interceptor works. And then there's more, there's features that I am not sure if you could simulate them with um, Vapmock or VCR. And so I wanna talk a little bit about more advanced concepts on how to use these interceptors. Um, a big one for me is simulating network requests. Um, request interceptors are set up in a way that they propagate errors or exceptions that are being raised in one of the endpoints. So 
I specifically disabled um, the fun Sinatra's functionality to handle uh, exceptions and propagate them through the entire stack, um, which allows, for instance, to simulate that a host is unreachable um, simply by raising the appropriate exception, which makes it very easy to uh, test your application or the library you're building, whether it's robust enough to handle these error cases. And then, of course, Sinatra gives you a lot um, of tools that you can leverage to um, make interceptor definition even easier and make the code more readable. And one of the most important things is probably that uh, being a standard Ruby class, you can just define private helper methods um, that you can use throughout your interceptor and throughout the customizations you use in your test suite. In fact, you can just apply standard object-oriented design principles to um, and all that Ruby gives you to sort of make your interceptors as readable and as easy to use as possible. Then there is the possibility of using Sinatra's before and after callbacks that run before or after a particular endpoint is hit. Um, and you could, for instance, utilize an after callback to automatically encode um, data into JSON. Let's say you're modeling a JSON API. Um, it's tedious if in any endpoint you always have to remember that you, at the, as a last step, have to uh, call to JSON on whatever you're sending over the wire. So just define it once in a block. And in this case, I look at the response. And if it's an array or hash, I encode it into uh, JSON. And then, of course, you have the ability to use uh, Rack middleware. Um, and in this case, um, we model both Shopify and Uber uh, interceptors as API, as JSON APIs. And um, so we always wanted to decode the incoming JSON so we can easily work with that in our interceptors. And um, Sinatra provides you with a method called use that allows you to inject uh, Rack middleware um, that runs before your actual endpoint is hit. Now that you have sort of an understanding on um, how you use interceptors and um, why they might provide a nice alternative to VCR or WebMock, I actually want to dive uh, deeper into some of the internals um, because I just think it's interesting to see um, some of the uh, powerful features Ruby provides and um, just as a sort of learning exercise. So um, in the beginning of the talk, I showed you that a request interceptor.run is sort of the core of, um, of the whole idea. And in fact, this is the concrete method implementation as it exists in the library. And um, there's essentially six steps, and I will go over all of these six steps to sort of showcase how you can mess with uh, an existing Ruby library that doesn't provide um, you with the ability to um, sort of do this in a clean way. Um, so the first step is because you can reuse an interceptor is to clear the transaction log. That's very easy. I just clear the array that keeps all the transaction log uh, entries from the previous run. And then I cache the original net HTTP methods because we have to make sure that once the block finished its execution, we restore net HTTP to its default behavior. And then I override the net HTTP methods with a custom implementation, um, just as WebMock does as well. And then I execute my test. And now my test um, will essentially use um, these overridden net HTTP methods. And then finally, I collect my transactions and um, then eventually restore net HTTP to its former glory. And um, the last part happens in, to, in an ensure part. Um, so it's always guaranteed to run and um, so that it doesn't happen that your test suite actually um, gets into a state where it's, um, where net HTTP is not um, in its original state. So, um, as I said, it's easy to clear the transaction log, so I just want to skip that and talk about caching the original methods. 
Um, there's three methods you need to override if you want to um, do something like incepting um, HTTP requests. There's start, finish, and request. Start and finish um, sort of take care of, the, uh, of opening the TCP connection, and then request performs the actual heavy lifting. And the way caching works in request interceptor, you have now a concrete request interceptor instance at your hand that is currently handling uh, your test case. And I just assign um, these methods to instance variables. And what instance method gives me is an unbound method. Um, so I essentially save the original method implementation and just put them for now in an instance variable. And then I replace these three methods with my own implementation. Start and finish are pretty boring. I just make sure that NetHDB thinks it has a, a, an open TCP connection it is communicating with, but in fact I don't need one because of how the redirect um, to the Sinatra application is working. Um, and I'll show that in a second. And then I define a new request method, which is a little more interesting. Um, the interceptor instance itself that is currently handling your test case has a request method of its own. And all I really do is I take the data that would usually go to net HTTP request and redirect it um, to my interceptor. And then um, I also pass in the interceptor itself. I won't show the code for request interceptor um, request um, because it's, um, yeah, it's a little more complex, but I at least want to explain what is going on. And you can always take a look at the source code if you're interested. So the first thing I do is I try to find an appropriate interceptor, meaning um, I look at the HTTP request and then look at the host name of this request and now go through my list of host name patterns um, and stored applications and see if one matches. If I find one, I now build a mock request and mock request, um, the initializer of mock request takes a rec application as its first argument. Uh, once I have that uh, mock request initialized, I can call the methods get, post, put, delete on them to simulate an actual HTTP transaction. And um, once that happened, I get back a mock response, which I now have to transform into a net HTTP response to make that HTTP believe that it actually just talked to, um, to a remote service. And then I log the transaction, meaning now I'm taking the mock request and the mock response and just writing them in my transaction log so they can be further analyzed in a test suite. The interesting thing is what happens if no interceptor actually matches your host name because um, I wanted to implement it in an unobtrusive way. I didn't want it to block just any um, HTTP communication, um, especially to be still compatible with MapMock and VCR. Um, so what happens is my current net HTTP instance, uh, which is now in this weird state that it talks to the Sinatra application, has to be restored um, to actually be able and perform um, network requests. And um, the way I do this is shown on the next slide. But once I restored it, I essentially um, perform the request as if there would never have been any interceptors uh, in the way. And method um, restoring works by utilizing Ruby's define method, which actually can not just take a block, but it can also take an unbound um, method. So the ones we previously stored in instance variables, we can now rebind to net HTTP, and we can even rebind them to concrete instances um, of net HTTP. And it is sort of happening when the request interceptor doesn't find a matching application, it rebinds the original methods to the concrete uh, net HTTP request that's currently going on, and then just calls request again and performs the request as uh, if uh, nothing ever happened. So that was essentially 
um, the internals of how the request cycle works in request interceptor. And um, if you compare that to WebMark, there's um, certainly similarities um, with the difference that um, you define a stub within your test, and in this case, I redirect to the Sinatra application. Um, I previously mentioned that there is error propagation um, that you can utilize to sort of simulate network errors. And I just wanted to quickly show how this works. Um, it is very simple uh, because Sinatra supports it um, by just using particular configuration statements. So all you need to do to sort of um, have a Sinatra application actually raise an exception and not handle it and have the calling code take care of that exception is uh, you disable uh, the show exceptions and you enable raise errors. And by that, you sort of switch Sinatra into an aggressive mode, uh, which does not make sense if Sinatra runs in a product uh, as your production application, but it makes a lot of sense to sort of simulate these network request errors. Um, well, I do have uh, further plans for uh, request interceptor. Um, so one thing I want to implement is um, the support of traits, um, sort of similarly named like the factory girl um, mechanism where you can um, define what your factory is building and then give it a certain trait of how it is actually building. And I want that for interceptors as well because I was running into the issue that I was simulating the same endpoint um, several times. And what I did so far was just having a lot of these uh, customized request interceptors um, but what I actually want is just in a particular test case, I want to have a name where I can refer to a, an endpoint definition and say I want my interceptor to run with a faulty implementation of my hello. And the faulty implementation could either be raising a 500 or um, raising a network error. Um, and I want to support different adapters. So I don't want to just stop at NetHTTP. The next thing I want to implement would be Faraday because Faraday would give me exposure to several other libraries because I don't really want to do uh, mess around with each of these libraries individual. Um, yeah, that is sort of the two goals I have in mind right now to bring this library forward. And that basically brings me to the end of my talk. Um, and I just want to quickly summarize um, what I've been talking about. Um, so request interceptors sort of provide a third alternative to VCR and WebMark. Um, the thing I like most of them is that I have a concise service definition in one place instead of scattering this definition across the entire test suite and they provide me with an easy mechanism to customize them if there is the requirement in a certain test. And then finally, Sinatra provides me with a lot of simplicity and flexibility, um, which ultimately leads to very readable code, which is just something I greatly enjoy. Um, if you're interested to take a look at the slides again, because I know it was a lot of content I was going over, um, they are available online. Thanks a lot for your attention.